You're listening to the Tabernacle of Prayer Sermon of the Week. We hope this message will encourage and inspire you to grow in the Lord. Since this thing has started, I looked for um, certain levels of church leadership to give us direction um, as a body of Christ or the part of the body of Christ that uh, is in our nation and um, I hadn't seen it Uh, I saw a lot of inspiration saw a lot of um, you know God is faithful and God loves us and he's our father and you know read Psalms 91 and all of that is good Um, but I didn't see too much of people of God this is what we should do and as the situation intensified over the last two and a half weeks or so, um, I began to be <clears throat> increasingly uh, troubled. And even though I had a scripture that I was dwelling on, uh, Matthew 24, where Jesus said there will be people who come saying that they are Christ and they'll be doing great things. Uh, and he said, but, you know, there'll be wars and rumors of wars. And he said, the see that you be not troubled. And so I really was dwelling on that. But um, in watching the news, the more and more I looked at the news was the more I got distracted. And the more I got distracted was the more fearful I became. Um, And the fear was... Not, I I don't want to say irrational, but the fear wasn't focused. So my fear was, I'm going to get sick. My fear was, I'm going to get robbed. My fear was, um, the government is going to shut us all down, and uh, we're going to be state prisoners. A lot of movies replayed in my head, a lot of conversations I've had with end-time studiers and end-time prophecy studiers and, you know, a lot of, a lot of things I've heard growing up in the church um, started to replay. And fear began to really grip my heart. And I sat down And I said to myself, I'm very familiar with this feeling. I'm very, very familiar with what's going on right now, how I feel. And I begin to think about myself as a child. I begin to think about myself at four years old, my dad taking me to swim lessons and I remember the anxiety and the tension in my stomach and the tension in my chest and this angst, this this doom and dread. I remember the smell of the chlorine. I remember uh, anticipating Saturday morning and fearing it and it was the same feeling I had been feeling, you know, over the last, you know, 10 days or so, and I begin to think about me being a child and being afraid of the neighborhood bullies, and me being a child and playing football and being afraid to get into the drills with the bigger football players on the team, and it was the same feeling, and the feeling of I grew up in the early 80s um, and in the 90s. Um, at the height of the AIDS crisis. And I remember being deathly afraid of the AIDS virus. And same feeling, hated going to the doctor. Uh, Thought in my mind that I would, something would be detected, some some kind of way I contracted something. It was always, I was always checking my body, always checking 
do I have cancer? Always checking how many times I went to the bathroom. Do I have diabetes? Always checking. Do I have high blood pressure? Something wrong with my heart? Something wrong? So I was very familiar with the feeling that the world is now experiencing, where your confidence is shook. And I began to repent because I didn't know. I, my steps, I was so afraid, my steps were unsure in my own house. I was afraid to walk in my own house. Not afraid to walk, but my body, my muscles, everything was just tense. Everything was just unsure, very unsure. And so I began to pray. I began to pray and pray and pray and pray. And I began to repent and say, Lord, I am sorry for allowing fear to run my life. Fear is my Lord. I've had two Lords. I did things. I made decisions. I went places. I didn't go places based on my fear level. If I wasn't afraid, I'd do it. I'd go. If I was afraid, I wouldn't go. If I was a little bit afraid, I may go. And I began to really pour out my heart to God and to repent because he says, do not fear. Which means, if, in the words of my good friend and mentor, um, he knows who he is, God bless him, if God gives you a choice or presents you two choices, the only choice you have, if the wrong choice was the only choice you had, that's it, thank you, Lord. If the only choice you had was the wrong choice, he wouldn't present you another choice. And so to fear seems like the only choice we have. And God says, do not fear. And so that choice is harder than the choice to fear. But the right choice is the choice that God says to choose. So I began to really repent, really repent. And as I was repenting and being prayerful, God started to deal with me about this, our, the, the state of the church in the nation. Um, the American church was not ready for this. We got caught undressed. You know how somebody knocks on the door? They say, oh, 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 hold on, hold on, let me, let me, I'll, I'll be right there. And you're trying to scramble, you're getting your pants on, you're, getting, you're trying to get, wrap yourself in the robe, you're trying to get to it so you can be presentable to answer the door. We weren't ready for this. I sat at home on Sunday watching the live stream, and I repented. And I said, Lord, I have taken coming to your house for granted. I've been in church all my life. I can't even count how many Sunday services I've been to. I can't count how many Sunday school classes I sat in. I can't count how many Bible school classes I went to. I can't count how many revivals I went to. I can't count how many choir rehearsals I've been to. And it got really, really boring. Not necessarily boring in the sense I don't want to be here, but there was no sense of urgency to be there. There was a sense of responsibility, so I was on time, you know, I was punctual, I was ready to do my job, but just to be in the house of the Lord was not an urgency or not an urge to be there, just to be there. And now I have the establishment telling me I can't 
come to the house of the Lord. And that's how you know this thing is of the devil. The Bible says in Hebrews 10 that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as some do. Even much more when you see the day approaching. And if this truly is the last days, like people, many people are saying, see the signs of the times, see what's going on, wake up church, all of that is true. Why are we not allowed to come together? Why is the threat of the linchpin of our faith, which is Resurrection Sunday, why is that fellowship in jeopardy right now? God did not send this, but he allowed it to get the church to repent. Not repent because you got sin, not like, oh, I can't stop drinking, oh, I can't stop fornicating, oh, I do this, I do. Not that type of repentance. We talk about changing your mind to be obedient to the will of God concerning your life. Full obedience. I was praying one morning after getting myself together, and it took me a long time to really get to a certain place. You know, the Bible says, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow. That secret place is under, it is in something. And if it was easy to find it, it wouldn't be a secret. So I had to work to find this secret place. I had to humble myself and repent and find a place in God. And as I was praying one morning, I started to realize some things. I believe the Holy Spirit put this on my heart. Fear is the barometer of sin that is in your life. The measure of fear you have gauges the level of sin and disobedience towards God that's in your life. And I thought about it, and I said, that's, this is kind of crazy. Well, you know me, you know those that know, I, I love the Bible, and I want to back up everything I'm doing the same with Scripture. So I want to turn your attention to Genesis chapter 3. It's a very, very familiar story. We all know it. We've all heard it preached a million times. All right, we know it. Genesis chapter 3. LOL. I'm so used to turning, and, but uh, we're not doing that these, this, this time around. Um, let's look at Genesis chapter 3, and I'm going to read it. All right? And it says this. We know the story. I'm just going to kind of breeze through some of the scriptures, the verses, to get to where I want to get to. Now, the serp serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field that the Lord God made, and he said to the woman, Did God say, eat, Don't eat of this tree? And the woman said, yes, we should eat. We could eat anything we want in the garden, but not of this tree. Verse 3. Um, I'm sorry, verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, you will not die. So he's already planting a seed of disobedience and contradiction to what God has said. Okay? It says, um, verse 5. God knows when you eat it, your eyes will be opened. Very key. Your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God knowing both good and evil, all right? The woman saw that the food, the good, the, the, that the tree was good for food, so her body, can, her natural physical need would be met, that it was desired to, it was pleasant to the eyes, meaning it looked good, it was appetizing, it was appealing, and that it was uh, desired to make one wise, she decided to take it and did eat and gave to her husband, and he did eat. And their eyes, and the eyes of them were both open, verse 7. And they knew that they were naked. Watch this, right? They knew 
they were naked. Their eyes were open. The serpent said, when you do this, your eyes will be open. You will know. They ate, and it was true. Their eyes were open. The Bible says that they sewed fig leaves together. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Right? Next, next verse, verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Well, they realized they were naked. They covered themselves, but they didn't hide. There was no fear until they realized the presence of God. And what's happened in the church in America today is we're afraid because we see the Bible coming true. And we're naked. Our covering that we made for ourselves is not sufficient. Covering outside of God's provision doesn't cover your nakedness. Your own working does not cover your nakedness. God's provision for your nakedness covers your nakedness. And so we see the spirit of God. We, we see the truth of God's word shining. And we are shaken. Because we're in disobedience. You know what we're in disobedience to? We're in disobedience to work in the harvest. The fallout from this thing, because it is going to end. It's going to end. The fallout from this thing happening right now is going to be worse than what's going on right now. Millions and millions and millions and millions of people losing their jobs. Millions or, or countless people losing their loved ones. Homes wrecked. People in disarray. People fearing death. Things being implemented and, and, and motioned put in motion for the next real destruction. And we have the hearts of men ripped up, the ground of their heart, the hardness of their heart has been plowed through. But the church is absent to plant seeds to water seeds, to reap harvest. The church is just as worried as the world. And so I want to encourage God's people this afternoon. If I can give some direction, let's change our prayers from God in this, or God heal, or God help them to find a vaccine. God help them, help the doctors, help you know, save us from this. No. Lord, let our prayer be, Lord, I repent to be obedient. I change my mind about your will for my life. I change my mind. I turn towards you. I turn towards you and what you have said for me to do. Because that's the only way that your life is going to be protected. When Gideon, we know the story in Judges 6, when Gideon was threshing wheat, he was doing so because the children of Israel were being um, uh, harassed and bullied and they were forced to be kind of like under 
And the Bible says that the angel of the Lord came to Gideon. Sorry, I won't do that again. The angel of the Lord came to Gideon and said, you mighty man of valor. But he was fearful. Again, in the words of that same mentor, I love him dearly. He knows who I am. He knows who he is. God bless him. He said to me, you can be afraid. You can feel fear and not be fearful. And I didn't agree. And I said, explain, explain that, bro. I don't understand that. That doesn't make sense to me. And he said, well, well I'm saying you can, you can feel fear. You can feel afraid and not be fearful. And I said, it didn't, re didn't resonate. I didn't, I didn't get it. And I said to him, as I was thinking, I said, you know what? Nope. I understand. Because I recognize that you are what God says you are. Gideon was afraid, but God called him a man of valor. Gideon decided, you know what? All right, Lord, I hear you talking. If this is really you, we know the story. Let this fleece have dew on it and let the ground be dry. Prove to me that what you're saying to me right now is legit. Because God has spoken to some of us and told us things to do. And we not believe in it right now. And we've asked for signs. God let that fleece be, have dew on it so much so that when he wrung it out, it filled a bowl. And then the next day he said, all right, check this out. Let the fleece be dry and the ground be wet. And it happened. And angel of the Lord talked with him again and he he made a sacrifice, whatever, and the fire, he was, it was accepted, and he realized he had been in the presence of God, and he started wigging out because he knew that being in the presence of God meant death because he knew the sin in his life. And this verse jumped out at me as I was reading Judges chapter 6. It says, verse 20, let's, let's do verse 22, right? Um, it says, um, when Gideon perceived that the angel was that when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O oh Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said to him, Peace be unto you. Fear not, you won't die. Sometimes God speaks and we forget what he said because of the reality of him in our face right now. This situation is very, very, very real. And the truth of God's word is coming to light in our eyes is very, very, very real. And it's so bright that it's causing us to forget what he told us. And we're focusing on this and saying, God's going to kill me. And God told Gideon, peace be to you. Do not fear. You won't die. So I'm encouraging us. Let's find what God said for us to do. What ministry did God give you? Are you committed? Are you ready? Are you willing? to work the harvest after this thing has happened, after this thing has come and gone? Are you ready to work the harvest? Are you ready to deal with the fallout? I want to share this video or this picture with you, and then I'm going to be done. I'm going to close with this picture. This picture 
is the, it is a, is a, it is a symbol or a representation of the thoughts of our country toward our God and the absence of the church's presence. We don't, we, we haven't felt the presence. The church's presence rather is not felt the way it should in this nation. We have, we're on TV and we can do plenty of things. Um, we have, we have great, you know, concerts and, you know, conferences and whatnot, but the power of the church and the influence of the church is dormant in this country. You got that picture, my brother? Is it up? God bless, because I can't see it here. It's up? Okay, amen. The bot, it's, 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 it's showing you Vice President Mike Pence praying for cor coronavirus experts to find a solution. And the caption says, we are so screwed. That's what people think. Let's pray that God show himself mighty. As they have challenged our God, let's pray that God show himself strong. Repent to work God's harvest. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Tabernacle of Prayer Sermon of the Week.